Thank you very much, Ian. Can everybody in the rear hear me? Okay, I am wired up. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, of course, I know who Henry Stimson was, what student of international security doesn't. And I've also long known about the Stimson lectures because two of my uh, favorite books, both of which Ian mentioned, Sam Huntington's book, Political Order and Changing Societies, and Thomas Schelling's very famous book, Arms and Influence, uh, were originally Stimson lectures. Uh, so it's a great honor to be following in their footsteps. Uh, and before I start, I'd like to thank Ian very much uh, for inviting me to be here today uh, to give this lecture and then, of course, to give the lectures on Wednesday and on Thursday. Uh, let me just give you a brief uh, overview of what I want to try and do. I, I want to start off with some preliminary remarks, just tell you some stories about the book, uh, its genesis, and so forth and so on. Uh, then I want to talk about the roots of liberal hegemony. Uh, and as will become clear as we go along here, this is really not much of an international relations talk. The international relations comes in the Wednesday lecture and in the Thursday lecture. Uh, what I'm going to try and do tonight is provide background uh, for those subsequent lectures. And that will become clear as I go along. So as Ian said, I'll be talking about the false promise of liberal hegemony Wednesday night and then Thursday make the case for a more restrained foreign policy. Uh, talk a little bit about the genesis of the book. Uh, first of all, when I started this thing about 10 years ago, what I really wanted to do is write a big theory book on the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, uh, and realism. I had written the book on realism, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, so I knew a lot about realism. But I didn't say much about liberalism in that book. And liberalism and realism are the two great isms in the IR world. Social constructivism, critical theory, Marxism, all these other isms are mildly interesting. When you strip away all the layers of the onion, it boils down to realism versus liberalism. I've spent half my life battling with liberals, right, as a good realist. So I knew a lot about that. but. I hadn't thought much about liberalism in any detail. And then there's nationalism. I'm a big believer that nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. That'll become clear as we go along here and in the subsequent lectures. I also believe that nationalism and realism are very closely related. Uh, almost all realists believe in the power of nationalism, but hardly any realists have written about nationalism. And nationalism is not incorporated into their theories. Right? So I started thinking about the relationship between realism and nationalism, and of course nationalism and liberalism. And what I wanted to do was figure out, in a theoretical way, just sort of how all of these isms fit together. The problem I ran into is I couldn't do it. I, I spent two years trying to write a book on it, and I couldn't do it. And I couldn't figure out how to organize it. it there was just no organizing principle uh, to make the book work. Then the second thing is, I could never figure out what liberalism really is, because the literature is just very hard to discern. And truth be told, it took me two to three years just to figure out what I'm going to tell you here today. It may all seem patently obvious, and maybe it is to some of you. I only wish you had told me before I spent two to three years trying to figure it out for myself. So I had a lot of trouble figuring out exactly what liberalism is. And then I couldn't write a book that did what I wanted to do. Now, there was another big issue I cared about, and that was liberal hegemony. Uh, liberal hegemony is basically the foreign policy that the United States has pursued uh, since the Cold War ended. Almost everybody I know agrees on this. Uh, some people use a different label for it, but I think liberal hegemony is a fair label, and it's one that many people use. It's very important to understand that the foreign policy establishment, or with Ben Rhodes, you remember Ben Rhodes, he worked for Barack Obama, he called the foreign policy establishment the blob. The blob loves liberal hegemony, right? It's, it's, it's the approved solution for how to conduct American foreign policy. But at the same time, there's a, there's a small group of foreign policy experts 
who think it's a deeply flawed strategy. And I'm one of those people, right? I, I think that liberal hegemony is a prescription for disaster, and I'll make that clear as we go along here, right? Uh, but we've never gotten much traction. And to the extent that anybody's gotten any traction, and I'll talk more about this, it's Donald Trump. Because you understand Donald Trump ran against the blob. And he got elected in part because American foreign policy is a disaster zone. Regarding the pursuit of liberal hegemony, just for background purposes here, between 1990 and 2000, you can argue that we did pretty well with liberal hegemony. I would argue against that, but you can make a pretty good case that that was the heyday of liberal hegemony. And since 2000, and certainly since 2001, everything has gone south. Uh, and the $64,000 question that's on the table today is what went wrong? You know, why is American foreign policy in so much trouble? Why was Donald Trump able to run against liberal hegemony? And he ran against almost every element of the liberal hegemonist agenda and get elected. Right? That's, that is the big question. And my argument is that liberalism is doomed as a foreign policy because nationalism and realism are more powerful forces and they undermine liberal hegemony at every turn. And if you think about it, focusing on what happens when a state pursues a liberal foreign policy and liberal hegemony in particular allows me to analyze the relationship between the three isms. So this is how I figured out how to write a book that dealt with the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, and realism by asking the simple question, why is liberal hegemony a flawed foreign policy? So in a very important way, the organizing question in the book is why was liberal hegemony doomed to fail? And the answer is in large part because of nationalism and realism. And in the process of laying this all out, I deal with those three isms. So I solved my problem, but it took me a couple years. My approach. My approach, and this will become clear as we go along, is to drill down deep and to try to understand liberalism at its roots. Uh, and what I really want to know to begin with are what are its starting assumptions about human nature. I, I've worked very hard here, and this will become clear as I go along, which is not to say people have to agree with me, to sort of figure out what the bedrock is that liberalism is based on, and then figure out the principal elements of liberalism, and then try to understand liberalism as a political ideology for a particular country, independent of how it works in the realm of foreign policy. So what I tried to do was not get wrapped around the axle about how liberalism applies to foreign policy. I just tried to figure out what the heck is this thing called liberalism? How do I think about it? And of course, in the process, as I'm thinking about liberalism, I'm trying to think about how it relates to nationalism and realism. And this is the table of contents of the book. Uh, chapter one is the introduction, so you don't have to pay much attention to that. But chapter two is on human nature. Chapter three is on political liberalism. That's liberalism inside the black box. That's liberalism as a political system in a country. And then chapter four is cracks in the liberal edifice. Those are tensions, potential problems with liberalism. And then it's not till chapter five that I get to foreign policy. So what I've done here is I've written a book that has eight chapters and I don't deal with IR or foreign policy until the fifth chapter. A number of IR friends who have read the manuscript don't like it really because they say, what are you wasting all your time talking about human nature and talking about liberalism as a political ideology? Who cares, right? I want to go right to IR. And the view that I have, which I'm going to try and lay out tonight and in the next two lectures, is that you really have to understand liberalism at its core 
to understand how it applies to foreign policy. Now, uh, ooh, sorry. I want to say a few words about me and liberalism, and then a few words about me and nationalism. I, I distinguish between liberalism at home and liberalism abroad. And I thank my lucky stars that I was born and raised in a liberal democracy called the United States of America. I, I'm not anti-liberal. Uh, one of the great paradoxes in this business is virtually all of the realists that I know are liberals in every way. Morgenthau, Waltz, these guys were, in terms of their domestic politics, they were liberals par excellence, right? But they thought liberalism as a foreign policy was a prescription for trouble. And that's my basic view. My basic view is you have to think about liberalism at home versus liberalism abroad. So I'm not arguing that liberalism in general is a bad thing. I like liberal democracy very much. Not perfect by any means, but I'm glad I live in a liberal democracy. My arguments are all about liberalism when it applies <coughs> abroad. I want to say about a few words about me and nationalism. Nationalism is, uh, in my opinion, the most powerful political ideology on the planet. Uh, it's no accident that the world is populated by really nothing but nation states, and nation states embody nationalism. Uh, and I think at the same time, it's very important to understand that at universities, especially places like Yale and the University of Chicago, nationalism's a bad word. I'm always amazed at how my colleagues at the University of Chicago really loathe nationalism. It just, it really rubs them the wrong way. And I understand that nationalism has a dark side to it. It has an upside as well. It has a dark side. Uh, but nationalism and liberalism, and this will become clear as we go along, are two different animals. Liberalism, as I'll try to make clear tonight, is all about internationalism. And universities are very international. And to illustrate this, I have a quote from Jonathan Holloway, who is the dean of Yale College that was recently in the Washington Post. This is a story in the Washington Post called, The Surge in Foreign Students May Be Crowding Americans Out of Elite Colleges. That was the title of the article. And this was Mr. Holloway's comment. We want to bring together an incredibly diverse student body, diverse in every way. If we want to train the next generation, and here are the key words, of global leaders, we better have the globe here. Just think about what this is saying. Right? This is an internationalist version of the world. And this is, of course, what university is all about. And I'm perfectly content to operate in this world. I would not want universities to become more nationalist. Right? I think the fact that universities are internationalist is wonderful. And I really don't consider myself much of a nationalist, although I'm going to make the argument that virtually every American is a nationalist. Right? I don't consider myself a nationalist in a deep-seated way. Right? But I think in large part that's due to the fact that I've operated in the academy for so long. And the academy is very internationalist in nature and is very uncomfortable with the concept of nationalism. But the point that I'm going to make here is that the United States is a very nationalist country. It's one of the reasons that Donald Trump got elected president. He fully understands that. He fully understands that. And if Donald Trump ever saw this and gave a 15-minute tirade on what the dean said and what the title of that article said, he'd make a lot of hay of it. He really would, right? So I just want to be clear that with regard to liberalism, I'm talking about liberalism abroad, not liberalism at home. And with regard to nationalism, I'm not making the argument that nationalism is this wonderful force all the time. Okay, roots of liberal hegemony. This is the talk tonight. As I said, you got to start with human nature. Remember, that was my chapter two. And when you talk about human nature, really what you're asking is, what are those common traits 
that all individuals have in common. And by the way, this is something that the founding fathers of liberalism paid enormous attention to. Right? And I believe that if you're going to think about liberalism and nationalism, you have to wrestle with these questions. And there are two big questions. The first question is, are men and women social beings above all else, or does it make more sense to emphasize their individuality? In other words, are humans fundamentally social animals who strive hard to car carve out room for their individuality, <coughs> or are they individuals who form social contracts? That's question number one. Question number two, second, have our critical faculties developed to the point where we can reach universal consensus on what defines the good life? Can we agree on first principles? Can we use reason? Are we able to reason our way through collectively and come to meaningful agreement on the big questions about life? Those are sort of the two big issues on the table when you think about human nature. Now, my views on this subject are that human beings are primarily social animals. Uh, we're born into societies, we're born into groups, and we are heavily socialized inside those groups, both by the family and the society around us in a really big way before our individuali individuality really gets to assert itself. Uh, I think human beings are very tribal, to put it in simplistic terms, from the get-go. It's not to say that you can't have a lot of individualism, but we're primarily social animals. And secondly, I think it's impossible to come close to reaching a universal consensus on questions about the good life. I mean, all you have to do is think about religion. Uh, do we have anything approximating a consensus on religion? Uh, can you use your critical faculties to prove to me that Catholicism is superior to Protestantism, or Protestantism is superior to Catholicism? And then we can throw in all the other religions? Or what if you're an atheist? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and you could point to all sorts of other examples. Uh, why does it matter so much who's, who's appointed to the Supreme Court? Why do we really care about that? Because we know it's the judge's opinions, the judge's personal opinions that determines what the rulings are when you're dealing with hard cases that reach the Supreme Court. That's why the Republicans care so much and the Democrats care so much. There's no truth, there's no universal agreement. I mean, there are people like Ronald Dworkin who push in that direction, but they're outliers among legal theorists, right? Uh, and uh, even at universities, do we teach moral principles? Do we have a body of moral principles that we teach to students? I don't think so. What we do is expose students to all sorts of different perspectives. We have no agreement on first principles. There are a few things that we agree on, but even if we do agree, once you get outside the university, once you get outside the United States, the idea that you're going to generate meaningful agreement, agreement on what's the best political system, liberal democracy, go to Russia today and ask people what they think of liberal democracy. 1990s. That's what liberal democracy is for them. They'll take stability every time over liberal democracy. So there's no real consensus here. This is my view. And what about liberals? The liberal take on human nature is that humans are basically atomistic individuals. The basic story. Uh, they operate as individuals in the state of nature, you know the basic story that Hobbes, who's not a liberal, but laid out many of the founding principles of liberalism makes, and that John Locke makes, that individuals are atomistic in the state of nature, and uh, they come together and they form a social contract so that the individual comes before the social. 
And then, of course, liberals believe that it's impossible to come close to reaching a universal consensus on questions about the good life. Right? So I agree with the liberal position with regard to the second question, but I disagree uh, on the first question. Whereas liberals think individuals come before society, I think the opposite. Now, if you put the two liberal assumptions together about human nature, what you end up is a world where individuals will sometimes have vehement disagreements about first principles. Right? Once you agree that individuals cannot reach a consensus on first principles, and first principles involve hot button issues, you then are in a situation where those disagreements might be so profound that you'll have violent conflict. So what this tells me is that the potential for mortal conflict sits at the root of liberalism. And this, of course, in the Hobbes story and even in the Locke story is why you leave the state of nature. And the reason that you want to create a state, you know the rest of the story. Right. But the point that I'm making to you here is when you look at the two bedrock assumptions about individuality and about the ability of people to use their critical faculties to answer the big questions of life, and you look at the liberal perspective and you put those two assumptions together, you get significant potential for conflict. And then the question becomes, how do you prevent conflict? How do you set up a liberal society so as to avoid conflict? I just put that up there because it's important to emphasize that when liberalism got its start, it was in large part concerned with the consequences of the Reformation, which was that Catholics and Protestants fought bloody wars in countries all over Europe. And again, the limits of reason show you that you can't answer which religion is superior but at the same time, there's no question that people are profoundly attached to Catholicism and hate Protestantism and vice versa. So how, how do you deal with that problem? This again is the problem that liberalism faces. My argument is is a liberal solution. It has three parts. First is inalienable rights. Second is tolerance. And second is the Night Watchman case. This is the hard core of liberalism. I'm going to make some additional points about differences among liberals in a few minutes. But when you talk about the liberal solution to the problem of conflict, there are sort of three elements that come together to, in effect, dampen conflict. The first is the concept of inalienable rights. What this says that is that every individual on the planet has a set of rights. It could be life, liberty, and property, so forth and so on. But every individual on the planet has a set of rights that are inalienable, that nobody can take away from that person. And inalienable rights are of enormous importance for solving this problem. Because, for example, if somebody has the right to life, that means you can't kill that person. Somebody has liberty, life, liberty, pursuit of property, all these rights. Everybody has those rights, and you're not supposed to interfere with them. And the second is the norm of tolerance. That should be a two and a three. The norm of tolerance. And Tolerance, in large part, grows out of this emphasis on rights. Because if, other pe if everybody has rights, and rights to think their own way, right, you, in effect, should be tolerant. So liberal societies place a very high premium on tolerance, right, in addition to rights. And again, the tolerance is inextricably linked with the rights. Once you have inalienable rights, there will be a big emphasis on tolerance. 
But the problem is, because of the vehemence of the disputes and the fact that there is a tendency for people when they really disagree to want to kill each other, tolerance is not going to be enough. And therefore, you need a state to act as a night watchman. Right? Liberals believe that you need a state. It's very clear that liberals have a mixed set of feelings about the state, in large part because a powerful state can threaten the individual's rights. But at the same time, virtually all liberals understand that you need a state, and you need a state to act as a night watchman. Because again, just to go back to square one, you have individuals out there who have profound differences about terribly important issues. And the question is, how do you prevent people from killing each other? And again, you emphasize rights, you emphasize tolerance, but those two things together are not enough. You need a state as well. Now, this begins to morph into the IR issue, and I, I want to just take a few minutes to lay this out without getting into the international relations dimension of things. The focus on the individual and his or her inalienable rights turns liberalism into a universalistic or universalist ideology. There's, in other words, there's this dimension in liberalism that grows out of its emphasis on the individual that makes it universal. What liberalism is saying is that every person on the planet has the same rights. Those rights are universal. They apply to everybody. If you focus on social groups, if you believe that human beings are social animals first and foremost, you end up with a particularist ideology like nationalism. So nationalism doesn't focus on individuals, it focuses on the group. And there is your group, and then there is the other. Right. It's a particularist ideology. That's not what liberalism is all about. Liberalism focuses on the individual. And once you focus on the individual, you quickly end up with a universalist ideology when you throw in inalienable rights. And of course, when you start thinking about liberal hegemony, just to get ahead of myself, when the rights of people outside the borders of the United States are violated, there's a very powerful temptation to go abroad. Now, take this a step further. There are two kinds of political liberalism. Uh, one is classical or modus vivendi liberalism, and the other is modern or progressive liberalism. Uh, I got this distinction mainly from the writings of John Gray. For anybody who's interested, he's written a book called Two Faces of Liberalism, which is an excellent book that lays this out. And Alan Ryan has also written an important essay that lays this out. Uh, so what you have is you have modus, what I call modus vivendi <coughs> liberalism and, and progressive liberalism. And, and these are the two different forms of liberalism that we want to think about. And the story I'm going to tell as we go along here is that progressive liberalism has trumped mod modus vivendi liberalism. We, we, we live in a world where progressive liberalism dominates, and I'll lay that story out. Before I go on to unpacking what modus vivendi liberalism and progressive liberalism are, I just want to say that I distinguish liberalism from utilitarianism and from liberal idealism. Uh, utilitarianism is identified with people like Jeremy Bentham, uh, and Jeremy Bentham hated the emphasis on inalienable rights. He said it was nonsense. Uh, and utilitarians and liberals tend to be at each other's throats in all sorts of ways. If you look at the debates between Ronald Dworkin and Richard Posner, uh, both famous legal theorists, Dworkin is very much a progressive liberal, and Posner is very much a utilitarian, and they bark at each other using the language of utilitarian and liberal. 
Uh, if you look at John Rawls, John Rawls frequently is barking against or barking about uh, utilitarians. So I'm not talking about utilitarians when I talk about liberals. For those of you who do IR in the audience and have read E.H. Carr, E.H. Carr's attack on liberalism, which was written in the 1930s, is an attack on utilitarianism and on liberal idealism. It's not an attack on the liberalism I'm talking about. Carr and I are going after very different targets. Liberal idealism, by the way, is identified with people like T.H. Green and John Dewey. I won't go into any details on what exactly it is, but it's a very different animal than the liberalism I'm talking about. And I'm not saying these two are irrelevant or not worth studying, but not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at progressive liberalism and modus vivendi liberalism, both of which focus in large part on rights. Okay. Now I want to do is, I want to distinguish between these two kinds of liberalism, right? And you want to remember that this is the hard core. So there's no question that both progressives and modus vivendi liberals emphasize those three elements. Now, in distinguishing between the two kinds of liberalism, first point I would make is it's not a difference that's based on reason. There are actually some progressive liberals who make the argument that we can use our critical faculties uh, to figure out questions about the good life. And actually, the piece that comes the closest to making this argument is Francis Fukuyama's very famous piece uh, on the end of history. If you go back and read Francis Fukuyama's piece after listening to my talk tonight, what Francis Fukuyama is basically saying in that piece is that with the end of the Cold War, we've reached the end of history. We're not going to have any more conflict. We're not going to have any more war because we're not going to have any more disagreement on big questions. He's basically saying liberal democracy won, and from here on out, the planet is going to be covered by more and more liberal democracies until we have nothing but liberal democracies. And liberal democracies never have anything to fight over. It's all been settled. That's his argument. But he's really the only person who makes that argument. And if you look at his book, he backtracks in the book. Okay? Uh, so uh, my initial inclination when I started studying liberalism was to think that there was a difference between progressive liberals and modus vivendi liberals that involved reason. But I don't believe that anymore. I think there are two big differences. The first big difference is between negative and positive rights and the desirability and efficacy of social engineering. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is he talking about? When we talk about negative rights, we're talking about you know, liberty. We're talking about freedom from state interference. We're talking about free speech, freedom of assembly the right to property, right? This is where you have a state that just protects your freedoms, right? Positive rights are where the state actually interferes to guarantee that you enjoy rights that are inalienable. And I think the best example of this, and I'll talk more about it as we go along, is the right to equal opportunity. If you look at uh, John Rawls and you look at Ronald Dworkin, they talk a great deal about justice. And justice for them is all about equal opportunity. And equal opportunity is where the state comes in and it levels the playing field. It's not equal outcomes, it's equal opportunity. Right. And needless to say, if you believe in positive rights, you're going to believe in the desirability of social engineering. Because there's no way you can put positive rights into effect without doing a lot of social engineering. So just to get ahead of myself a bit, if you're doing negative rights only, right, all you want is a state as a night watchman. Here we go. Modus vivendi liberals. 
modus vivendi liberals. This is Friedrich Hayek. For anybody who really wants to sort of read a canonical version of modus vivendi liberalism, read Friedrich Hayek. I think Locke fits in the same rough category. Negative rights over positive rights. Modus vivendi or classical liberals really dislike positive rights. I think it's fair to say Hayek hates positive rights. He thinks the state should not be doing social engineering. They loathe social engineering. They make the argument, almost all of them, that not only is it not desirable, but we're not good at it. And that's why we shouldn't do it. You know all the arguments. Republicans make these arguments all the time, that we should let the market decide how to solve problem X or solve problem Y, because markets are much more efficient than the state. When the state gets involved doing anything, it bollockses it up. That's the classical liberal, the modus vivendi liberal view. Progressive liberals, on the other hand, they believe in negative rights, because everybody believes you need the night watchman to protect those liberties. But progressive liberals also believe that it's very important for the state to get involved, to do social engineering, to create a level playing field. Right? There are all these positive rights. It's like, just, just think about medical care or health care. Do we believe in health care in the United States? I think the answer is yes. I think if you look at the Republicans, they can't just kill Obamacare. They have to replace Obamacare. Because I think we've reached the point, and I could go into this greater detail in the Q&A if people want, we've reached the point where basically everybody believes that people have a right to universal health care, a right to health care. Right? But once you start talking about a right to health care, you're talking about positive rights. Right? The state's involved in social engineering. And of course, this is why Republicans dislike Obamacare, because the Republicans talk like classical liberals, although I'll make the argument in a short time that they act like progressive liberals. You see, that's the difference between modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals. It's not that one believes that you can use your critical faculties to reach conclusions about first principles and the other doesn't. I thought that initially, but no. I think that Modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals have a difference about rights, right? They have a difference about rights and a difference on social engineering. Now, my argument is that with the passage of time, progressive liberalism has trumped modus vivendi liberalism or classical liberalism. Not at the rhetorical level, but in practice. And let me just say a little bit about this. Uh, we have, in the United States, a remarkably powerful state that intervenes in almost all aspects of our life. It's involved in heavy duty social engineering. And there's no way you can get around that. And the Republicans, just to talk about this in some detail, the Republicans constantly talk about how terrible this is and how they want to change things, and how when they get elected, we're going to let the market do this, and we're going to stop the government from doing that. We're going to get out of the business of doing social engineering. But if you look at how Republicans behave in contrast to Democrats, there's hardly any difference at all. There's no evidence that Democrats spend more money on social engineering than Republicans do. There's no evidence that Democrats create more institutions than Republicans do. The Republicans created the Department of Homeland Security. The Republicans created the Environmental Protection Agency. Ronald Reagan spent one heck of a lot more money on social issues than Barack Obama did. And even in cases where Democrats outspent Republicans, you look at different presidents, it's by tiny margins. So there's just not much difference at all. Uh, there is one political party in the United States that actually truly believes in modus vivendi liberalism. Uh, it's represented by the Libertarian Party. The Libertarians are classical liberals. 
or modus vivendi liberals. No single, no single libertarian has ever been elected to Congress. And in the 2016 presidential election, the libertarian received a little over 3% of the vote. So the idea that we have a political party that really represents modus vivendi liberalism and stands a chance of winning is erroneous. It, it's impossible. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party, despite all the rhetoric, are deeply committed to progressive liberalism. That's to say they're deeply committed to social engineering and they're deeply committed to positive rights. You can make the argument that the Democratic Party is more committed than the Republican Party to positive rights, maybe so. But the Republican Party is also committed to positive rights. Now, why is this the case? It really all began, at least in the United States, in the late 1800s. And it's a function of three things. One is the Industrial Revolution, two is nationalism, and three is these huge wars that we fight. Just on the Industrial Revolution, what happened when the United, when the United States really uh, was hit hard with the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th, early 20th century is you had these huge industrial enterprises that came online uh, that did certain things uh, that had huge consequences for people all over the United States and indeed for people all over the planet. And it became very obvious to politicians at the time. And here we're talking about Republicans because you understand that the original progressives in the United States were not Democrats, they were mainly Republicans. Herbert Hoover was a social engineer par excellence. Teddy Roosevelt was a social engineer par excellence. Right? And uh, the reason was that you had to manage this economy. You had to manage these huge industries and figure out rules and regulations. You had all sorts of labor unions, labor problems, child labor problems, and so forth and so on that had to be managed by the state. There's no way you could avoid that. And then, of course, when you start fighting wars, whether it's the American Civil War, World War I, World War II, uh, the state gets involved not only in running those wars, but when the wars are over with, you have to do all sorts of social engineering to reward the people who fought the wars. You remember the GI Bill? The GI Bill is a perfect example of a positive right. It's social engineering. I could go on and on about this. Right. And then there's nationalism, of course, which I'll talk much more about next time. Right. When you start thinking about nationalism, what happens is that the state has all sorts of reasons to want to organize people down below for administrative reasons, for economic reasons, for military reasons. The state gets in the business of doing social engineering in a big way. Right. When you think about nationalism, the state is interested in creating a coherent nation and it wants that nation to be loyal to the state. That involves doing all sorts of things of an administrative nature, again, of an economic nature and a military nature. And of course, with nationalism, people in the nation have a certain loyalty to the state. This is the nation state. The nation has loyalty to the state. And the end result of that is that the state is expected to do things for the nation, for the people. And of course, you're, if you're in a liberal democracy like the United States, politicians who promise to do all sorts of things for people tend to get elected over those who promise not to do big things for people. So in a liberal nation state like the United States that undergoes the Industrial Revolution and then fights big wars, for all those reasons, you move into a world where progressive liberalism dominates. And again, progressive liberalism is all about positive rights and it's about social engineering. So here's the modern liberal template. Core assumptions, individualism, no universal agreement on first principles. Okay, those were the two starting assumptions I had about human nature. Second, Progressive liberalism has triumphed. 
And with progressive liberalism, you get negative and positive inalienable rights. Those are inalienable rights, those positive rights as well as those negative rights. You get tolerance and you get a state that engages in social engineering. That's the basic liberal story. Now, how does this apply to IR, just to get ahead of myself? There are two very important dimensions to this story. One, I've already emphasized, and that's the individualism, right? It's the individualism and the inalienable rights that creates the universalist dimension. Cannot underestimate the importance of this. Liberals, and this is certainly true in countries like the United States and Britain, tend to see people who live in other countries as having the same rights as them. And because they place such a high premium on rights, liberalism is all about rights really matter, when the rights of those people are being violated in a serious way, needless to say, it's going to create a very powerful incentive to see if you can fix that problem. And if you're the United States of America and you are super powerful, it's not surprising that you're going to be at least tempted to fix the problem. Right? So again, that focus on individualism is so important. Right? married to inalienable rights. The second thing that really matters for the international relations dimension of my story is the social engineering. Once you accept the fact that progressive liberalism has triumphed and that we live in a world where liberals are committed to social engineering. And by the way, even if you weren't a liberal, you'd have to be committed to social engineering, just given the complexities of, moderns, uh, of the modern world. Whether it's a liberal state or not, it's going to be an interventionist state at home. But this liberal state called the United States is heavily into social engineering. But if you're into social engineering at home, it doesn't take long before you think you can do social engineering abroad. I remember the Iraq war, which I adamantly and publicly opposed before it happened. And I would say to people, do you seriously believe that you're gonna go into Iraq and do social engineering in a country that you really don't understand? We can't even do social engineering at home, much less in a foreign country. But I'll tell you, those boys and girls who took us in, they were very confident that they could do social engineering. They're Americans. These were skill thinkers. These were people who knew how to do business, right? So we went traipsing into Iraq. And of course, you know what happened, which is what I'll talk about next time, right? But the point is, when you unpack the liberal story, right, what you see is this. Next lecture. Next lecture, what I want to do is I want to explain the logic behind liberal hegemony. I've obviously told you part of the story, but I want to unpack it in even greater detail. In other words, the story tonight is basically about liberalism and its roots and liberalism as a political ideology inside a state. Right? I want to explain liberal hegemony. Then I want to provide evidence that it does not work as advertised. Indeed, it leads to untold trouble. I want to talk about NATO expansion. NATO expansion was liberal hegemony at work. Nothing to do with realism. I want to talk about the Bush Doctrine in the Middle East. And I want to just show you how much trouble we've had. And then I want to explain why liberal hegemony fails. I want to explain what went wrong with NATO expansion. I want to explain what went wrong in the greater Middle East, right? And of course, you're not going to be surprised to hear that my story is all about how nationalism and realism thwart liberalism. That's my basic story. And of course, all of this is to say that I, in a very interesting way, ended up, in the end, dealing with nationalism, realism, and liberalism, and comparing those three isms. Although when I started the book, I couldn't figure out a way to do that. Here at the end, I did it. Now, whether I succeeded or not, you'll tell me tonight and on Wednesday and on Thursday. Thank you.